Glory to God in the highest. Praise the Lord for another blessed day that he has created. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This has been a wonderful, a blessed, beautiful year that we have made it through. We made it to the end of the year, even though sometimes it's been challenging. People have lost their loved ones. Some lost their jobs. Some lost their homes. Many people have gone through devastations in their life over in Russia, even in uh, Israel. It's, it's just the wars are going on around the country. And here in the United States, people have even experienced uh, a lot of difficult times in their life today as well. So we just want to continue to lift up our nation, lift up our cities, and lift up our communities that God will bring healing and bring deliverance in the lives of his people. We know that this is a hard time for people. Some people can't even bear with the difficulties that they have gone through. Some have lost their mind. Some have been faced with critical illnesses. Some have been put in a position of brokenness and needing a savior, someone to lend a helping hand. It, it's just been a lot going on in the lives of, of God's people. But tonight we want to continue to, to pray for our nation, pray for our cities, pray for our people, pray for our churches, our pastors, our leaders in our churches, our leaders in our country. We want to continue to pray that God would have his way in the lives of all his people. It's so much that's going on. And if we don't pray, we'll never see God move in the lives of his people for the better. But I believe God is doing a great work in all of our lives for the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before your awesome presence tonight, O oh God, to tell you thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for bringing us through this year, Father God, in spite of the hard times and the challenging moments, the situations which occurred in our lives, and even, Father God, the brokenness that many have experienced. We thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned us. You never turned your back on us, God, but you've been right there in the midst of it all to bring us through victorious, God. And I thank you, Lord God, as we come in toward the end of the year, Lord God, we're still grateful because we're still here, Father God. We could have lost our lives in an accident or a bullet could have shot us, Father God. Anything could have happened, oh God, to alter our lives, but yet, God, because of your covering and your protection, God, you kept us from danger, seen, unseen, oh God, and we're grateful. Now, Lord, I ask you to forgive us for our sins tonight, oh God. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Clear our minds, clear our hearts, receive your word. Father God, speak by your spirit. The engrafted word of God with meekness to save our souls and draw our attention to you, Father God, to examine our hearts to see where we have allowed the spirit of Jezebel to inhabit our fortress, Father God that you allow, allow you to strip her out of us, Father God. In the name of Jesus. Father, so many people have been violated by the demonic force of witchcraft, and Father God, and the Jezebel demonic spirit, Father God, and have lost their control, Father, even self-control, Father God. But today, God, we come taking back our authority, taking back our right, we're taking back our minds, our hearts, taking back our anointing, God, that you would destroy the yokes in our lives and remove the burdens. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Priscilla. Prophet Priscilla, bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Amen. I got a little late started tonight. Had a little difficulty with the technology. We're here that's glitching and doing some goofy stuff. But, you know, God is still good. We're going to go continue to move on move on in our, our lesson tonight i've been talking about breaking the threefold demonic cord of the enemy and um last week we were talking about neighbor how neighbors had a vineyard and you can find this lesson on my youtube channel on the link that's attached to the uh, the live tonight how jezebel husband ahab the king went to neighbors won his vineyard for his own possession but Naboth wouldn't sell his possession because according to the Israel custom, any inheritance that you receive, you were in violation of God's law if you sold it to any other person. But anything that God bless you with, you are to maintain your promise, maintain your blessing, and don't allow the enemy 
to deceive or manipulate you to giving up something that's right for you, yours. So Jezebel took it on her own accord. Since her husband tried three times and could not overcome Naboth to persuade him to give him his land, his vineyard. His vineyard was a very pricey, it was a very beautiful land, and it was a wealthy, prosperous land. And it's a place where it brought wine for many different people in that Israel during the time. And so she wanted that land so bad. So he, she went and decided to get the land from it. So she you know, devised a plan to manipulate him and deceive him, to go into a fast and prayer. And then they had people to stern against him, you know, to make it seem like he was out of order because, you know, with God, when, when all you seek God, you have to be in order. You especially when it comes to prayer and consecration, you got to be in right line with the Spirit of God to do what God wants you to do. And because he was not the one in position to even summon this fast and consecration, Jezebel, she deceived him, even got the signet ring of the king to put this, this, this order in place to manipulate Naaman to give, in this, give her this land. I tell you, boy, it's the devil is a lie. The devil is, is very conniving. He's tricky. He's con, he, he always has a way to, to do something deceptive in the life of a believer to distract us. We have to be aware of his devices. We have to be aware of his tactics and how he comes along to get you to sell your inheritance. So like Esau stole Jacob's birth, birthright, you know? He sold his birthright to Jacob for some soup, you know, for portage, the word says. And we have to be careful when God gives you something that's of value, you maintain it in the spirit of God. Amen. So when I'm coming out of the book, Breaking the Threefold Demonic Cord of Jezebel, Athalie and Delilah. You can find that book on Amazon. You can find it. In the Kindle version, you can find the physical book as well as on Amazon, even on christianbooks.com. You can find it on there as well. It's a really good book to add to your library because it opens your eyes up to see how we've been influenced by the death structure of the enemy through Jezebel. Jezebel is a very wicked, strong spirit. And when she banded together with her daughter and her granddaughter, that's how she was able to overcome Many people, because she stole their authority. And she didn't have the right of the king until the king relinquished his authority to her. And you got a lot of leaders in the church are doing the same thing. They're relinquishing their authority to a lesser person because they're not rising up against controversies or different type of situations that arise in their ministry. And God is trying to provoke us to get into our rightful place as a leader and stand firm on the word of God. If something's out of order in the house of God to correct it, he's going to judge the leaders. He said, he said, judging will start at the house of God. It starts with the leaders in the house of God. When well, we're not in right with God, not walking in God's will and doing what he wants us to do. God says, judging going to fall upon you. Amen. So in our book tonight, glory to God, we're going to go into our book tonight. Jezebel's plans of destruction are the same today. Jezebel's plan of destruction are the same today. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Jezebel has planned and schemed to steal neighbor's inheritance. That demonic, the demonic force Jezebel despises Plots to steal our promises today. Isn't that something? The same spirit that operated over 2,000 years ago during this time when Jezebel and Ahab was in, in reigning as king. And she was the queen. She was wicked. She was destructive. She was a manipulator, a deceiver, a conniver. And it says, she devises plots to steal our promises today. 
The same way she plotted against him, it's the same thing that's happening in the church today. Let's go on a little further. So the principalities war relentlessly to steal our future, operating through illegitimate authority. The demonic forces of Jezebel attempts to negate every free breaking. My God, my God. Listen to this. It says, prophecy and promises we have received from the Lord. We will discuss more about this later. But now, for now, we're going to focus on how Jezebel desires to steal our future and our inheritance. That's her plan. That's her plan. She wants to steal your future and your inheritance. The word tells us that we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. God bless you, uh, Pastor, Pastor Deborah. God bless you. The word says that when Christ rose from the dead, he said God gave us every precious promise through his word, which is our inheritance. We have an inheritance that's not of the kingdom of the world, but the kingdom of God. It's up to us to realize and recognize what our inheritance is and maintain it. The enemy knows what your inheritance is, but you don't know who it, what it is. So we allow the enemy to come into our lives to distract us, to blind us, to deceive us, to draw us away from our promise. Whatever it is the calling on your life God is giving you, you have to know that without a shadow of doubt. Your own personal conviction. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus, the anointing on your life, what you have been ordained by God to do in this season of your life. As we're approaching the end of the year, so many people have gone through so many different situations. Some experience grief through death. Some experience homelessness. Some experience critical illnesses. It's been all kinds of wars and rumors of wars in different places around the country. Wars in our cities, our communities, people against each other, in our churches, a lot of manipulation and deception in the church. And the enemy is doing his job. If he didn't manipulate God's people, if he didn't come to wreak havoc in the church, he would not be doing his job. The reason why the word tells us we are to pray without ceasing. For the will of God of Christ Jesus in you. We have to be on guard. The word says be diligent, be sober, be alert. For your adversary, the devil, is, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you're not prayed up, you're not spending time in the presence, not studying your word, not consecrating and, and to keep yourself built up in the faith. You leave yourself open as a prey for the enemy. And the enemy looks for that type of mindset to infiltrate. Our mindsets, we talked about this before, is a fortress. And in that fortress is everything you need to war off your enemy. But the problem comes in, we don't tap into it. The word said the, the stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. I said, this was marvelous in our lives. This is of the Lord's doing is marvelous in our lives. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So in order to even realize that the cornerstone was built in my life with Jesus Christ, I have to study the word of God. Get the word in my spirit. Speak the word over myself. Even when I don't feel well, when my body is hurting, things are falling apart around me, my finances are all jacked up, my home is in confusion. I have to guard my fortress. The reason why you see so many war movies where they have a castle and they have a fortress, they have a wall built up. Some have a large gate that they can open and close. 
Some have a drawbridge. They can lower down and raise up. So when the enemy is coming, they have their soldiers already in position to know what area of the castle is being left vulnerable to go and guard it. Our mindsets is a fortress. And we have to know where to dispatch our angels to guard our minds against the attacks of the enemy. If you don't guard your mind, you give the enemy free access to come into your life. That same spirit that Jezebel has, the same spirit comes to your life to attack you. And it will cause you to lose your mind. You know what the enemy wants out of you as a child of God? The greatest thing the enemy wants out of you is your anointing. He knows the anointing is Jesus Christ. The anointed one who lives in you. The word said Christ in you is the hope of glory. So I have an expectation that I will go to glory to be in the presence of the Lord forever. So in this life, as I guard my heart, Guard my mind, guard my spirit, guard my mouth, guard my ear gate, guard my eye gate. I can have an expectation of the hope of glory. Because the enemy knows if I can get you to the place you're not prayed up, he can weaken you. You know how he weakens you? Through other people. He sent people in your life to come around you to weaken you in your faith. They come with negativity. They come with swearing and cursing. They come make you a dumping ground with all that garbage because they want to weigh you down where you have no power to resist. And that's the plan of the enemy. That's why it says the same spirit that's working during that time of Jezebel is still operating in the same plan today to bring destruction in our lives. Let's go a little further. Neighbors cherish his, his inheritance. He values his birthright and was not going to sell it out to anyone, even for profit. Unlike Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, Naboth understood the importance of maintaining in the, possession, in the possession of his inheritance. Likewise, we should value God, what God has spoken in his word concerning our future and our promised success. Breakthrough and victory. Through the enemy's, or though the enemy's, strategizes to seduce us to sell out and set up for less than what God has for us. We must maintain determined never to allow the enemy to steal our blessing. Don't let them steal your blessing. Don't let them trick you up. Don't let them stop you. Your inheritance is much more than a valuable vegetable garden. Your inheritance is something you must hold on to. Don't sell off for something insignificant that has no value, no worth. Solomon says this, the wisdom of man is all this vanity. He's all futile. It's fruitless. When we try to live our lives without God, we have to realize that wisdom of God will instruct you, will counsel you, will guide you, will give you understanding to make the right decision and right choices, even the right investments. There are people out there who are planning to start businesses in the new year. 
Sean Plain to start ministries in the new year. But if you don't receive the wisdom of God, the knowledge from God's word, all will be vanity. Because the word of God says when you get wisdom, get understanding. And all that getting, get understanding tells us. Because wisdom will cherish you. Say so wisdom will keep you. Wisdom will cause you to prosper. You cannot prosper outside of wisdom. And guess who wisdom is? It's God. Your inheritance is much more than anything the world can offer you. You got to know your inheritance. When we get Christ Jesus in our lives, he becomes our inheritance. Everything he is is deposited in you. And it makes you fruitful and abundant in the kingdom of God. So when the enemy comes to try to make you doubt your inheritance, you can remind him that Jesus paid the price on the cross for me to receive the inheritance of this life. His life in you is your inheritance. Prosperity is your inheritance. Success is your inheritance. Victory is your inheritance. Faithfulness and overcoming is your inheritance. Healing is your inheritance. Deliverance is your inheritance. Everything he is, you're entitled to it because he deposited it in his heavenly bank account. And all you're going to do is receive it by faith. That's why the word tells to be givers. It says when you give, Luke 6, 38, it will come back to you. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give it to your bosom. That's what the word is talking about. The inheritance comes from your giving and your faithfulness to God. God don't care about your money. He owns everything, the earth and Lord and the food thereof and the world and they dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. But God looks for a heart that's obedient to give to respond to his love to help somebody else. See, that's a whole other message by itself because we're stingy people. In the, in the body of Christ, we're stingy. We're selfish. That's the Jezebel spirit. That Jezebel spirit makes you selfish. When you have a brother, a sister need, I read this in 1 John, I forgot what chapter it is. It says, when you have a brother who's in need, and you tell him, be warm, be well, and you walk away, it says the love of God does not dwell in you. We have to recognize, if I say I love God, I have to be a giver. There's no way around it. I have to be a giver. I gotta give my time, give my money, give my service, help people. Because that's the very thing Jesus did. He demonstrated the very act of love through giving in healing many who are oppressed of the devil, raising the dead. Opening blinded eyes, unstopping deaf ears, making the dumb speak, the lamb to leap on their feet and praise God. We have to get back to the place of the basis of the word of God. So we study the word of God and know what God says about ourselves and, and apply the word to our heart. Because I can't serve God half-heartedly. You know, I wasn't going to do the class today. I wasn't going to do it today. Now, I pondered this all day. I wasn't feeling well. My back was hurting. I had to walk my cane down the hall today. And, and as I began to move around, and I'm listening to the praises, I keep my house saturated with praise all the time and worship. 
Because every time I get into the presence, revelation comes. And when the revelation comes, strength comes. And when the strength comes, the power comes to do what I don't want to do. And as I trusted God, in his word, I went down to the mailbox on the first floor, came back up to the second floor, went to the third floor, get something from a friend that's moving out the building, came back to my apartment. I'm moving around constantly. And as I'm moving around, I'm just praising God. I'm thanking God for his, his healing power, his anointing over my mother, over my father, over my family, over those who I know who are afflicted, over those who are broken right now, those dealing with grief in their hearts. I got a friend I talked to last night, and his life is a wreck. And the next step is death. He done had five surgeries. He done went through lung surgery, two hip surgeries, and the doctor would do more surgeries. And I said he was stressing himself to me. All these things are going on, taking medications, can't think right, forgetting things that he normally remember. I began to weep in my spirit. I said, God have mercy. Because <coughs> so many people have been violated this year by the Jezebel spirit. And it brought affliction. Because some afflictions are spiritual afflictions. And the enemy brought affliction on many of God's people with the purpose to kill, steal, and destroy. And God says we got to build ourselves up upon our holy faith in God. As I begin to stand on that word, I begin to pray for different people walking throughout the house, doing different things. I'm like, God, you knew these things were going to happen. You're the answer to that situation. You, you have the power. Why don't you heal them, God? And God told me this. Some people never be healed physically, but they be healed spiritually. It's not up to us to determine or make a decision of what God is going to do, but trust God. We have to trust in the plan of God even when I don't see it working in my life. We have to stand on the word of God even when I don't feel like standing. And know that God got me in his power. Two types of inheritance are biblical. You have spiritual inheritance and physical inheritance. According to the patriarchal Studies in Genesis, the firstborn son legally received the birthright or inheritance. Listen to this. The firstborn son is entitled by birthright to the inheritance that the father or the ancestor leaves for their children and their children's children. Some are physical inheritance. Some are spiritual inheritance. And in the absence of a son, another relation could become their heir. Isn't that something? I was reminded of the story of Joseph. Joseph's father, the one who married Mary, the mother of Jesus, his father had a brother-in-law. And Joseph's father wasn't able to bear children. Joseph was the father of, of another person. And so because of this birthright, Joseph's father died, and it says he never had children. So the father-in-law came along and married his wife, and that's where Joseph came from. So when he married her, she had Joseph, and God had a plan to send Gabriel the angel. Oh, my God, this is really good. He sent the angel to proclaim to Joseph in a dream that I have called Mary to bear my son, Jesus Christ, in the earth. 
that she's going to be better. She's going to be the mother of my child. Never touched by a human being. And because of the plan, everything God has spoken to the prophet Isaiah, Ezekiel from the days of old, everything came to be according to the plan. And right after that, when Jesus came along, Mary had other children. So that lets you know it's in the plan. Even though it looks like your, your vision is dying, it looks like your plan is never going to happen. You know the prophetic words got spoken of you, and it seems like it's null and void. You got to believe that hope against hope, just like Abraham. Read Genesis chapter 12. On to the latter part of that chapter, when God called Ab Abraham, he was Abram. God called Abram, so I'm get thee from thy country, from thy kindred, to a place I will show thee, for I am going to have called you to be the father of many nations. All in the plan. Everything God promised him, it came to pass. Even when he messed up. And took Sarah's handmaid and had a child by her. God still had a plan. His plan was not known. It was not voided by his mistake, his actions of unbelief. But God still fulfilled the plan. Because he didn't do it, Jesus would have never came. My God, my God. So I want you to know tonight. So if you don't have a son in your generation, Another person in your bloodline can become your heir because it's all in the plan. The nation of Israel, God's firstborn, had the legal right to an inheritance from God. The Israelites' physical inheritance was the land of Canaan. Ain't that something? God promised them A land flowing with milk and honey. And all they do is follow him. What's your promise today that God giving you? Are you following God? Or are you following your peers? Or are you listening to the naysayers? Or are you listening to other people who influences you to believe it's never going to happen? The children of Israel had that problem. When you study the history, when it came through Exodus, through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, these different passages of scriptures, when God brought them out of Egypt, 11-day journey became 40 years because they doubted the promise. They knew what God said. They knew the leader God gave them, which was Moses and Aaron. But they doubted the plan. Therefore, they murmured, complained, and grumbled themselves out of their inheritance. But you know what? God said, you know what? Even though the ones I brought out of Egypt negated the plan, guess what? I'll give it to the younger generation. So the younger generation are the ones that God brought up after they died in the wilderness and gave them the promised land. And they went into the land and God told them many different laws and requirements in order to maintain the inheritance, but even they were rebellious. Reminds me of the church today. The same Jezebel spirit is a work in our churches today for you to negate the plan. Because God gave us a plan. He gave us a promise. He gave us an inheritance. And we negate the plan when we begin to doubt God's word and doubt what God can do and cannot do in our lives. Because we stop believing in faith in God. Jesus told disciples, he said, have faith in God. 
Even when Jesus was on the boat, he sent the disciples to go to the other side of the seashore. He went into the hull of the ship and fell asleep, or the boat. And a storm arose. And when the storm came, they panicked. They had their inheritance right there in the boat. They had their security in the boat. Everything they needed right there in the boat. But they negated the plan. Because they couldn't see the victory. They couldn't see themselves overcoming the storm. What is it in your life tonight that God is trying to open your eyes to see, but you're not seeing what God sees because you allowed yourself to be filled with so much negativity of the world? God says, if you let me come in to your heart and to your fortress, I'll come in. I'll set the record straight for you. I'll build the fortress with the presence of God. Because the word says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain who build it. God says, I will come into you and build my fortress inside of your mindset, in your heart, that I can live as king of glory in your life. My God, my God, my God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Well, let's move on. Let's move on. I'm, getting, I'm excited, y'all. I'm excited. I thank God we made it this far in the new in the old in the years. The year about to approach the new year. I thank God. It's been a challenge. It's been a journey. But we made it this far. A few more days left before the new year. And we're going to cross over by faith. As long as we keep our eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ himself. Let's go a little further. Their spiritual inheritance was the blessing passed down to them as God's chosen people. You hear that? You understand that? Do you believe that? Your spiritual inheritance is the blessings and the promises God has passed down to you through Jesus Christ. Descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land of Canaan then was only a portion of the inheritance. You hear that? Only a portion. It wasn't the full measure of the inheritance. And interestingly, even today, that battle for the land still exists. They're still fighting. Look at Hamas in Israel. They're fighting for territory. Prophecy being fulfilled. They're still feuding over something God gave Israel. And Israel is feuding over their adversaries. Because they're not trusting God like they need to be to a degree. For centuries, the nation of Israel has been and is still warring over land given to them by God. That's something. So you look at the news, Fox News, ABC News, NBC News, British News. You see all of this going on in our country, in our land, because the people are still fighting for territory. Christians today have access to God's inheritance through adoption. You hear that? You believe that? You have an inheritance through adoption? We've been adopted in the beloved. So everything God has promised is yours by faith. We're not his firstborn, but have become heirs through Christ redeeming work on the cross. Where, therefore, we refer to the promised land as our spiritual land of promise. It involves our future and all God has for us. 
Christ, as a lamb slain, has given us victory over death, sickness, and disease. And one day we will rule and reign over our enemy, all our enemies. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 18. You write down these reference scriptures here on the screen. Write down these scriptures and read those. These are good scriptures to read. Proverbs 13, verse 22. A wise parent leaves an inheritance for his children and future generations. It's a great blessing to receive an inheritance from loved ones. Not all people, however, fully understand the importance of inheritance. Many parents do not consider it wise to save for the future and leave an inheritance. Even more sadly, many children do not position themselves to receive an inheritance. So parents don't leave an inheritance. Children are in a position to receive an inheritance. Some are strung out on drugs. Some in prostitution. Some living a lascivious nice lifestyle. It's many different reasons. People, they forfeit, forfeit, they forge their inheritance. We have to really pay attention to the Spirit of God as He's moving in our lives and He's opening up our understanding. Because if we don't walk into the promise of God's Word, how do you expect to receive your inheritance? As previously mentioned, in weak moment, Esau, the son of Isaac, sold his inheritance to his brother, Jacob, for a bowl of soup. He sold his full inheritance, both physical and spiritual, because of a fleshly desire. So, dear ones, the enemy has the same plan today. The hoarders of hell apply great pressure to cause God's children to give up God's inheritance. Ain't that something? Satan belittles the value of the inheritance and tries to convince each of us that our inheritance, the land of God has promised us, is good enough for only vegetables. He lurks in the shadows waiting for a weak moment to take our blessing. He intimidates, he lies, he strategizes, manipulates circumstances to get us to surrender and run for what belongs to us. He wants you to run from your promise. He wants you to give up. Don't fight for it. You know how you fight for your promise. You fight by faith to believe what God says in his word is yours. And, and the enemy can't have it. He only can take what you give him. If you give him access he takes everything. He takes your peace of mind, takes your power, takes your strength. He'll take your life. Amen. My God, my God. Precious child of God, don't sell out for vegetable gardens. Don't sell your inheritance for a fleshy desire. You have been given a promise from the Lord. Be determined to hold it what God has promised you. Don't allow the enemy to seduce you to letting go of all God has for your future. I'm going to say that again. Don't allow the enemy to seduce you, to pervert you, to corrupt you into letting go of your promise for your future. Stand firm in every promise and speak boldly to the enemy. I will not sell my inheritance. It's worth fighting for. How Jezebel operates today. The demonic influence of Jezebel has not changed much over the last several thousand years. She still uses the same techniques in trying to steal the inheritance of God's people. Ain't that something? The same tactics. Jezebel uses witchcraft. Now it, it's happened when Joram saw Jehu, then he said, it is peace, Jehu. So he answered, what peace? 
as long as the holly trees of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Now you're going to find out from reading 2 Kings chapter 9 who Jehu is. He is a king who God raised up to fight against Jezebel and Ahab. And who God gave a prophetic word that Jezebel is going to be thrown from a window and going to be crushed in the ground and the dog's going to lick up her blood. Because one thing about God, he says, vengeance is mine. Said the Lord, I will repay. If God said vengeance here, you can guarantee he'll fight for you. He only fights for those who are his. Because the word tells us God knows those who are his, but the wicked he knows from afar. If you are living in a holotry life of sin, people think holotry is a sexual sin. No, it's a spiritual sin, a perversion. Because you're playing with other demons and allowing them to seduce you and have spiritual sex with you to turn you from the Lord. And God is saying today, I'm opening up your eyes. I'm opening up your ears to hear so you can see and hear what the Spirit says to the church and what he's doing in the church. Jezebel often manifests through divination and witchcraft. These are her calling cards. Jezebel actually uses the spirit of divination for her spiritual inspiration. I've known people throughout the years who turned to fortune tellers, soothsayers, harlot, harlot, warlocks, and warlocks and witches and trying to get an answer to speak to the dead, of the dead ones who passed away. Because they haven't let go. Which reminds me of Saul. When King Saul disobeyed God and did not kill the Amalekites, but he kept the spoils and the king alive and different things that God told him not to keep. Samuel the prophet came and told him, because you rebelled against God, your stubbornness is idolatry and your rebellion is witchcraft. He said, you're going to die. Because God said, you and your sons are going to die. So when you have torn the kingdom because when Samuel turned to walk away, he ripped his garment trying to get him to beg and plead to God for him to not do this to him. And Samuel said, because you've done this, you've torn the kingdom of God from you. And because of that, he goes to a witch to inquire of her to call Samuel from the dead. Because after a period of time, Samuel died. And Saul goes to the witch indoor and asks her to call Samuel up from the grave. Listen to this. Jezebel actually uses the spirit of divination for her spiritual inspiration. Saul went to a witch for his inspiration to get an answer to the problem he had at hand. So the end of the witch, Saul disguises himself so she didn't, wouldn't know he's the king. He disguised himself. She calls Samuel up from the dead, which was really was a demonic spirit. Because God is not going to allow a witch to call this servant up from the dead. So she caught a manipulating spirit up from the dead, but the spirit spoke the same thing Samuel spoke. Which indicates that God can still use even a demon to speak a prophetic word. And the same word Samuel spoke, the demon spoke the same word to him. And he eventually saw in him dying his two sons. To put it simply, divination is witchcraft. In Acts chapter 16, verse 18, Paul addresses a woman with a spirit of divination. 
if she continue to cause much distraction. Read that. Read that in the Bible. Go, go read Acts chapter 16. Paul addresses a false flattery and drawing attention to himself. A tactic of Jezebel, a stronghold. Through spiritual discernment, Paul identifies the evil spirit and check this out and cast it out of her. You know one thing about God, when God is in control, it doesn't matter what you try to do, who you try to conjure up from the dead, who you try to go back and follow that's, the, uh, that's not of God. It is not going to prosper. Doesn't matter what you do, how you pray, how you try to manipulate and connive and control and draw people to follow you when you're not walking in God's will yourself. Kindred spirits will attract the same familiar spirit. Kindred spirits will attract the same familiar spirit and will cause you to be out of order with God to invoke his judgment on yourself. The demonic power of Jezebel is a manipulating, controlling, seducing force that uses flattery words to seduce and infiltrate Listen to this, our emotions. Ain't that something? You got a lot of people in the body of Christ are very emotional. They're not prayed up. Anything make them upset. Any, anything make them lose ground. They become unstable. Become double-minded. The word says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you are not stabilized in your mentality, You'll be unstable in all your whole life. This evil spirit force, force flatters with sincere compliments. Insincere. Insincere compliments. It'll puff up your ego. It'll tell you what you want to hear. Even though it ain't true. You wear certain clothes, you know good and well. You don't look good in those certain clothes. And the enemy tell you, oh, you look good in that just to flatter you. And all the time, they, they backstabbing you, talking about you behind your back, cutting you down, spreading rumors about you, and, and, and just do, doing what they can do to destroy your character. You ain't prayed up. You get up before the church to preach a message. And you know good and well the Spirit of God wasn't on you. And he said, oh, yeah, you did a good mess knowing, knowing it was a flop. You know it was a flop yourself. And they tell you, oh, you did real good today. And then they go tell everybody else, oh, he's, he was terrible today. I don't know who he think he is. You can tell he ain't prayed. He ain't been in his word all week. You can use his shows and his actions. People are going to tell you what you want to hear. Because they know flattery. But God is saying tonight, as his children, pay attention. Allow the Spirit of God to make you get to the place of discernment when you begin to seek the face of God daily. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead God and direct you. We're going to stop in a few minutes. But I just want to encourage you tonight. Don't allow yourself to be seduced by a controlling spirit, a seducing spirit, of the enemy that will infiltrate your structure of your mindset. It says a compliment can be wonderful. We all need compliments. But when a wrong motive is attached, listen to this, this is good. It comes from a wrong spirit. My God, my God, my God. People don't mind complimenting you when you're doing good. But then you have those who are jealous and envy of you who will compliment you with false pretenses, looking for a foothold 
to get into your life to discourage you and make you feel inadequate and feel like you never measure up to God's standards. We have to be careful of the voices we entertain allow the Spirit of God to speak to us by His Spirit to lift us up upon His Word to build your self-esteem to let you know you're a person of value. You're worthy in the eyes of God. He called you. He qualified. He ordained you for such a time as this. You need to know it for yourself. The motives behind false flattery are manipulation and control. If I can manipulate you to follow me, I can control you. You got a lot of pastors, apostles and bishops are in positions of manipulating their people to follow them. And they preach a message that satisfies their itching ears to turn them from the true faith to follow false doctrine. You don't believe it? Look at Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Read chapter 2 and chapter 4. It tell you about the things that are going on, about the people of God. So they, they turn to follow God's doctrines that satisfy their, their itching ears. They don't want the truth. They become lovers of themselves and not lovers of God. Because they have been manipulated and controlled by demonic forces of the enemy. And God is saying tonight, beware, be aware. For your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, prowling about, seeking whom he may devour. The Hebrew word for flattery is shalak or shalak, which means to divide, be smooth and seductive. Ain't that something? That's how the enemy does. He don't come to you bodacious. He don't come and say, hey, I'm here. I'm here to deceive and manipulate you and control you to destroy your life. I'm here to mislead you and get you to follow after things that's not of God. No, he comes smooth and seductive. Remember Genesis chapter 3? When he came to the Garden of Eden? What did he do? He was smooth. He was seductive. He knew just the right words to say to lure Eve to follow his plan. He does the same thing today in the church. He knows exactly what to do to get you to follow his plan. He works on your conscience. He works on your mind. Because he knows if I can fill your mind up with all the devices that the enemy has to offer from the world. I can control your thought life. I can make you feel suicidal. I can get you into depression. I can make you feel that it ain't no use of living. And that God is judging me. The reason why things go wrong in my life. And all the time God is saying, that's not me. I didn't do that. That was the enemy. The word flattery derives from the root, root word. Smooth, slippery, and deceitful. Smooth, slippery, and deceitful. So the enemy is so smooth, like putting a banana peel on the ground, you slip on it, you fall. Right? You ever see those cartoons where uh, uh, they're running and somebody throws a banana peel, like Road Runner and Coyote, for example. And Road Runner puts a banana peel. Matter of fact, no, here it is. So Road Runner and Coyote, right? We have, we've seen that cartoon many times. So Coyote calls himself going to put a banana peel or some type of destructive device in, in the pathway that the Road Runner would run to trip him up, to make him fall, so he can catch him, 
so he can eat them up. And all the time, he ended up falling to his own device. The same way he tried to trick him up, an anvil falls on his head, a bomb blows up, he slipped on his own banana peel. He falls into his own trap because the deceiver would be deceived, the word says. So any time the enemy comes to other people to deceive you, God says, let them do it. Because the deceiver will be deceived. Listen to this. These are characteristics of a snake. And we know who the snake is. Not surprisingly, the Hebrew word for serpent. <laughs> I told you that's a good lesson tonight. Good lesson. The Hebrew word for serpent is linked with divination. Witchcraft. Seduction. Smooth. Slippery. Deceitful. A manipulator. A conniver. All because that is the characteristic of our adversary, the devil. If you sense that someone is falsely flattering you, then be cognizant of an in, ultra interior motive and the underlying witchcraft at work. So if you realize and you see somebody that's in your life trying to trap you up, you need to pay attention that it's witchcraft at work. If I desire that a person has an impure motive and then he or she pours out on the compliments, I become fully aware of the spirit of witchcraft. It's attempting to gain entrance. You hear that? That spirit of witchcraft is plotting and planning to gain entrance. Where at? In your fortress. And control you. If allowed, Jezebel will root and bring separation and division in your life. That's a shame. And a lot of people, they fall prey to that because they're not prayed up. We're going to stop right here tonight. They're not prayed up. They're not seeking the face of God. They're allowing themselves to just go through life without spending time in God's presence. It is so important as a child of God to join all of us in Christ Jesus by coming together in prayer and seeking God's face. You pray for me. I pray for you. We watch God change things because we know God is in control. And we know God has built a fortress around all of us when we come together in prayer. He says, one can put a thousand to flight. Two can send the legion fleeing or 10,000 fleeing of demons when we come together in faith on the word of God. So I encourage you tonight, pay attention, pray, seek God's face, allow the wisdom to come into you from the spirit, give you insight, give you discernment, give you understanding of what spirit has infiltrated your structure that you have given access through into your life. And allow the Holy Spirit to purge it out of you. I guarantee when you surrender to his lordship and authority, the pathway becomes smooth, the crooked places become smooth, the rough places become plain, because God is in control of your life. And it doesn't matter 
what mistakes you've made, how you messed up and fell apart. Doesn't matter how much you slipped on your spiritual banana peel and, and you fell into your own trap of deceit. I'll come to let you know tonight that we have a Savior. His name is Jesus. The word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the reason for this Christmas season, that he was born in a manger as the king of glory, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. We're talking about the king who was born in a manger, who lived a human life, to show us how to go through humanity and face obstacles and trials and tests and come out in the end victorious. Because when he died on the cross, guess what he did? He took your shortcomings, your hang-ups, your habits, your, your miss-ups, your hang-ups, your, your mistakes. He nailed it on that cross that you can receive the new life when he died on that cross, when he rose again from the dead. He rose with all power in his hands that you and I can receive the new life by accepting him as our Lord and Savior. For the word says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made, with the heart man believeth, Unto righteousness. So all you got to do is believe. You might be a backslider tonight. You might be one who's slipping on a banana peel. One who's been playing with harlots. One who's been playing with other lovers in the spirit. The Lord says tonight, if you come to him, he'll make your slate clean as if you never made a mistake at all. And all you got to do is pray this simple prayer with me. I want everyone, if you will, pray this prayer with me tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge, God, that I messed up. I made mistakes. I was selfish. I was foolish. I was rebellious. I even turned my back on you sometimes. And I ask you, Lord God, to come into my heart to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Remove all the characteristics of Jezebel from my heart that I have nothing to hinder me from accepting you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask, Lord, you come into my heart right now. Be the Lord of my life and be my Savior for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. If this lesson has been a blessing to you tonight, would you send up those Facebook stars tonight on here? Allow God to use you to be a blessing. I guarantee when you bless God's servant, God in return bless you double. I'm a living witness. It happens all the time. Every time I give, it comes back to me. Good measures, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. And then I turn around and bless somebody else. Again. Because I love to be a giver in the house of God. I've been so blessed this year by being at Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church. The last several years, God has really been blessing me. Even when I made foolish decisions, God still blessed me. You know why? Because I had a repentful heart. And every time I realize, any time I slip up and make a mistake, I know who to go to. To find mercy and grace and help in the time of need. And God cleans my slate every time and gives me a new start. A fresh anointing falls upon me. More wisdom, more insight, more understanding. And God keeps on using me to display his glory in the earth. So I encourage you tonight, let the Lord touch your heart to be a giver that his glory would be revealed in your life. 
even if you give to somebody else, be a giver. Don't be stingy. Don't be selfish. Because you cut off your own blessing. I'm going to say this one final point that God spoke to me last week. I was sharing with a brother. And I said to this brother, I said, you know what? When you're trying to trust God to do something, and you don't do what God says to do, to be a giver, he says, why is my house empty, desolate, and your house is full? He said, you build your house up to do your own pleasure on my holy day. He said, so I blew on it. I blew on your finances what became a pocket with holes in it. I called the wind to blow on everything you have to make you bankrupt. And I said, when you change your attitude and become who God called you to be, a child of the Most High God, God will cause you to prosper in health as your soul prosper. Anything you need God to do for you, God will cause somebody's heart to be touched by his spirit to help you fulfill the plan and the promise that he has for your life but you have to be obedient to the Spirit of God. So I want to encourage you with those words tonight. Say Happy New Year to you. I don't want to hear from you or see you in the new year. I pray God bless us all to cross over the threshold into the new year. I pray the promise of God fall afresh upon every individual that he empower you with his anointing to walk in the promises of his word, to be faithful, to be more diligent, to be a studier, a steward of the word, that God can fill you up with his presence till he overflows out of you to reach somebody else's life, and that he will continue to be glorified in all that you do. May the Lord bless you May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord give you peace. You all be blessed on the night. Any questions, anyone, before we go? Any question? God bless you, uh, Verdine. God bless you, my sister. Praise the Lord. Glad you came on tonight. Pastor Denise, Pastor Deborah, God bless you both. Amen. Lashonda, God bless you all. Minister Lashonda. Prophet of Deshonda, my fiance, my, my ride or die, my woman of God. And I tell you, I can't wait to that day when God set things in order for us to cross the threshold of marriage. I tell you, I'm expecting it. I'm looking for God to do it. And I want her to stay encouraged. Keep doing what God called you to do, love. Don't allow the enemy to distract you either. If you keep moving forward in your purpose, your calling on your life, let the Lord use you. And I guarantee as you continue to go through your refreshing, God has a great anointing. Oh, shut up, I'll say it. Oh, A great anointing is falling upon you even now, says the Spirit of God. I'm increasing even in your finances. I'm increasing in your health with the wisdom and knowledge from the Word of God. God says, I'm going to cause the river of the anointing to flow through you. That when you come in contact with people who need healing, who need deliverance, the Spirit of God will begin to speak by His Spirit into you to flow into their lives, to bring change as you trust in His Word. So you stay encouraged. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Don't let him put out your fire. But let that fire burn as it did when God burned in the fiery bush before Moses. And He told him, don't come any closer. For the ground you stand on is holy ground. God says, make your ground a holy ground. When you make your home, your place where you stand in authority as your holy ground, God says the anointing going to wax even stronger, even in your children. Your children know God. 
But God says there's a great anointing even coming from their lives. Because I have a great work even for the children to do in the new year, in the season of their lives. As you walk by faith in the promises of God's word, God says, teach them the word. Speak over them the word. Pour into them the word. To so let the word flow from you into them. And watch God elevate your life and your calling to a higher dimension in him, says the Spirit of God. Amen. I, I just felt the God, the Lord tell me that to say that. I felt the Lord say that. But I thank you all, Pastor Denise and Pastor Deborah. I thank you all. You all have been a blessing in my life. Like the year of our name, you've been a blessing in all of you. And many others who are not on tonight who have poured into my life throughout the year. I, I thank God for you all. And I pray God continue to bless and keep you in his will and prosper you in everything you do for the glory of God. You all have a great night. Amen. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. Walk in your purpose for purpose. Because you have been created with purpose, on purpose. And let God use you in his will for the glory of God. Have a good night, everyone.